Lost Property, Chapter 13. This chapter now looks at Josh when he actually comes back to work after that whole incident of, um, of the auction and finding out about Clive. And he speaks to, to Clive here. I spoke to Mr Whitworth after the auction. Bidder 79, it was you. You bought back everything from the suitcase, I said, bewildered and miserable. My eye stayed focused on the suitcase because I couldn't look him in the face. Clive replies, well, not everything. Okay, some of the jewellery was too expensive, so he couldn't buy it back. He then, you know, sits down and, and, and continues the discussion. Why didn't you take all of all these things home on Saturday? They're yours now. You paid for them. So Clive has purchased them and he's left them back in the lost property office. And uh, Josh basically says, you paid for them. They're yours now. Do remember that, you know, in our society very much, once you once you actually pay for, for an item, then it is technically your possession. However, that's not the way Clive responds. So after Josh says, you paid for them, they're yours, Clive says replies no all these things belong to someone else that's what the lost property office is for to get lost things back to their owners but how can people claim stuff when you're hiding it clive sighed i was only hiding it so that it wouldn't be auctioned off for a few dollars i can't let them go not yet so the truth here comes out Clive is not a thief, as Josh immediately assumed. Yes, he was hiding those items. But the reason for that was so that when the auction came round, they weren't put out, weren't sold. He was actually keeping them. He was keeping them in the hope that whoever owns those items would actually come back and collect them, even if it was well after the auction date. Josh's uh, response here but and we're on page 116 of your book by the way but if you lose something you go looking for it straight away don't you if you don't it's gone forever not always it's not that way for everyone he seemed suddenly self-conscious at the way we all stood facing each other sit down Josh he said and positioned a chair at the table for me he sat on the other chair and pulled the thermos towards him do you want a cup I remembered Mum on Saturday morning with the coffee. It was a comfort thing, a prop to ease conversation. I nodded. Okay, so he's finally got the idea of what it is to, to uh, sit down with a, a cup. It's a sedgeway. It's a way of continuing a discussion. And Clive then continues. Not everyone leads a simple life like you and me, Josh. Things go wrong for them. Some of the items that end up here weren't left behind out of forgetfulness or confusion. Sometimes a person is taken off a train by the police or rail security. They end up in jail or a psychiatric ward. They might not sound like the best people, Josh, but some of them need what they've lost more than the ones who come in here for their umbrellas or mobile phone. The creepy guy, just before Christmas, I said immediately. He was looking for his diary with addresses and phone numbers. Clive nodded. Yes, he'd lost part of himself somehow and that diary would have helped him get it back. But his bag was never handed in. I was certain of that as soon as he described it. You remember? Things like that I remember. It's like I said, you get a feel for things. I looked down at the music box and the rest. The empty space around them accused me. Oh God, what had I done? The jewellery, you couldn't afford it. It's gone now and lost thanks to me. The guilt was crushing me. How much did you spend? I'll pay you back the money. No, Josh, don't be ridiculous. But I messed it up for you. You're trying to help people and I got in the way. It's not your fault, Josh. I shouldn't have let you see the suitcase. I pressed him harder about the money until he snapped. Stop it, Josh. Keep your money for the music you play with your friends. Okay. Again, this idea of materialism versus sentimentalism. So Josh feels guilty about the fact that he has thwarted 
uh, uh, Clive's intentions of keeping the items and, and you know, hopefully for people to come back to them. He now realises he's not a thief. He realises you know, what he's done. So his immediate response was, I'm going to pay you back for everything you spent. And that's the materialistic sort of view attitude. And what Josh doesn't realise is no amount of money is going to pay back for the items that have been lost, the items that have gone to sale. Even if he pays back Clive, it's not going to, it's not going to change things. It's not going to solve the problem. So his idea of materialism versus sentimentalism. Okay, so to talk about this idea of sentimentalism and the reason why Clive keeps all these items, um, he then actually goes on in the next um, couple of pages and explains each of those items and how important um, they are. He says things such as when an item is handed in, I might hear about its circumstances, occasionally things will come in after an incident, you know, an arrest that got gets reported in the papers. But mostly it's intuition. Here I'll show you something. So bending forward again and setting his tea carefully on the table, he took out the Bible and from beneath the box of paints. Okay, so he opens up the box and paints and he basically gets Josh to understand that the artist who actually painted that the picture of, of the woman on the inside um, did it with great care to the point, well, he actually loved her. And to lose something like that would be devastating for, for that person. Um, he then goes on to talk about the photographs um, that he actually gets developed um, with his own money. So if a camera comes in, he'll check it, he'll take out the roll of film that we're still pre sort of the digital phone age. Um, it's actually still film at that time. He gets them developed and he keeps those photos. And he does record uh, an incident where a, a woman who's come looking for the camera, not the, itself, but because her son and granddaughter had been tragically killed in a, in a rail accident and it's the last photos of, um, of the family that she wanted. So he then goes and, and, and really explains to, to Josh the reason. He says to Josh here on page um, about 119, 120, You think I'm a crazy old man, don't you, Josh? No, not at all, not at all, I repeated. I really wanted him to believe me. And this is uh, Clive's reply. I do it for myself, Josh, as much as anyone else, he confessed, glancing down at the photos. Oh, I don't kid myself that it's very important, but I've got no one close to me anymore to do anything special for. No wife, kids gone and taking care of themselves, my grandchildren out of reach. I don't feel like I'm alive unless I'm doing some good in the world. Now, that line about him being alive unless he's doing some good in the world does actually come up in your task. And it's this idea of, well, why Clive is actually doing what he is doing. And also what comes up in this um, section is this idea of altruism. And altruism is basically about uh, caring for the needs and happiness of other people and being willing to do things to help them even if it brings no advantages to yourself and when you think of Clive he doesn't get any benefits um, in returning the items I mean sometimes people will, will return precious items and then get a reward I mean in our society we hear of that many times where um, you know people will hand things in and then they're issued with a reward. Well, that isn't quite altruism because you're, you're getting something back for the good that you are doing. But think of Clive. He doesn't get anything back materialistically. But what he does get is a sense of happiness. He gets a sense that he's helped somebody. And that in itself, I suppose, is its own reward and that's why he does it. And the fact that he has nobody. Okay, he does mention the wife's gone, the kids are on their own. So for him, helping out strangers, helping out other people, is what keeps him going. He is a person, he's a good person, he's a very good person, who actually needs to be helping other people, and that brings him happiness. 
And do remember going right back to the beginning of the novel where I think the statement from Eleanor Roosevelt was that um, happiness is a byproduct. You don't necessarily go out to achieve happiness, but when you do something, then you feel it. So it's a kind of a, a secondary thing that comes. And with that, gentlemen, we leave at the end of the chapter.